Oh, fantastic session on corporate social responsibility. Why is it so fantastic? Is it because I think that in the end, uh, the future of uh, the economy and our corporate enterprise is closely very interrelated with the social responsibility of enterprises and its arm, arm the environment criteria, societal governance uh, stakes that are actually enabling, like Albert Camus used to say, that the world breaks apart. Parti particularly important today because in a, quite an interesting way, in a surprising way, we s note that in the U.S. we have today a, a movement by ultra-conservatives, the ultra-conservatives who place their criticism, the strongest criticism, against the social responsibility of enterprises. Why? How? How they go to the extent to say today that they talk about a woke capitalism. And this uh, reminded me of something I remember back in the 60s, 70s, uh, Milton Friedman, the great economist, was saying about the social responsibility of uh, corporations. He said, it's socialism. And he explained that the enterprise, the corporation, is uh, is the same as the, the stakeholders, the, sh the shareholders, and the interests of the enterprises and the interests of the shareholders is one and the same. And that the corporate leader is nothing but the agent uh, holding a mandate from its owners that of uh, the capital of the shares, the shareholders. So this conception he had of the enterprise was supported by the idea that the interests of the shareholders were converging, and probably in the long run, in the long term, with the interests of the enterprise. And the interests of this company, enterprise, in terms of profitability, were uh, the same as the interests of the company. And so it would seem to me that in a certain way this vision is uh, particularly limited and erroneous and that there has to be pressure, a pressure applied so that we ensure the convergence of the interests of the shareholders and the interests of the enterprise, but there has to have we have to exercise a pressure so that the interests of enterprise can converge with those of the shareholders, I think he meant. But this pressure can only come from the outside world. And so what outside world are we talking about here? We can think of the state, but as someone said, famous, the state is not cannot do everything. We can think of, and I think that's become quite essential to the pressure exercised by the civil society, particularly youth, which can no longer accept today that enterprises behave haphazardly, uh, especially for the E of environment, S of society, soci sociability, or the G of governance, SEG. And that's what we are witnessing today, and that's we will, what we will see more and more in the future. We need to imagine a world where corporations will be increasingly constrained by the pressure of the civil society and youth so that, these, so that they behave in a virtuous manner. And this presupposes that this is opposed to the concept Milton Friedman had, and it's totally in opposition with the conception the ultra, the U.S. ultra-conservatives can have on what they call 
the woke capitalism. Friedman said the re social responsibility of corporations is just socialism. It's, he was an ultra-liberal. And today, what um, our ultra-conservatives in the U.S. Uh, uh, blame is to make the shareholders lose money, to make the shareholders lose them by taking actions that are not in agreement with the shareholder value. And so the fundamental question is the following. The shareholder value cannot be the only criteria that rules over enterprises. And we need to pull out of the contradiction between the search for this the research and the, the, the maximization of the profit rate and the needed evolution of societies or companies, societies. And I think it's the destiny of our civilizations, and I'm weighing my words here, to make corporations evolve in that direction. And for this purpose, we essentially uh, need to make ensure the change, that the enterprises change, that they not only it's not only the thing of the only shareholders, but of all the stakeholders. And it's in the stakeholders we should include society and without a doubt also nature, the nature that we can personalize. So thank you. And I will now hand over the floor to successfully to the six speakers of this panel, starting by my far right, which is Monsieur. Martin Coiteux. Six minutes he has, Monsieur Martin Coiteux. And be careful, I'm the, time, the timekeeper. Thank you, extreme right. Uh, it's, no, 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 I'm not uh, far right, especially when we talk about uh, CSR. I will uh, uh, allow myself to go back to Freeman very briefly, in a nutshell, because he had made an important criticism of the CSR in the 70s. Uh, obviously, we li we're, li we're in a different world today, but we need to uh, remember the Friedmanian conception. Friedman conception, enterprises should maximize profits under constraints, but the constraints Friedman had in mind was to respect the law, okay? To respect the regulations, to go abide by regulations. And only the state could co constrain the way through which the enterprise could maximize its profits. So as we said the state is not perfect, the laws aren't perfect, legislations aren't perfect, the regulations are never, is never um, comprehensive, especially in a world of externalities, in a world where you have different opinions that are expressed in civil society. And so the enterprise was not capable, and this was, it was totally irrealistic, unrealistic, to live inside the companies in the universe Friedman had defined it. Because enterprises, in fact, and to learn how to maximize the profit, yes, for sure, but under multiple constraints and of uh, an increasing number of stakeholders besides shareholders. And so until then, it was to consider the social responsibility of enterprises as a constraint among many others to which are faced enterprises. But that was just a few years ago already. And since then, we've witnessed, maybe with the change of gener generation change, and it was probably one of the strength behind the change, the pressure of the stakeholders, consumers, the workforce, civil society, uh, environmentalists, uh, certain companies that took a leadership stand or position. And rather than considering the CSR as a constraint, they turned it into an important asset an important vector of their enterprise, corporate strategy, business strategy in the long run. And so we saw the advent of new criteria that corporations wanted to uh, meet. We saw objectives that had to be reached in terms of uh, uh, environmental objectives and social objectives. Uh, when you're a corporation and you set these criteria, and when you set objectives, well, you have to be able to measure uh, those objectives. And that's how, slowly but, but surely, we started talking about a concept which is very closely related to the CSR concept, 
even though it's rather a little different, is that of the ESG criteria we just mentioned. And uh, it's the quantitative transpo transposition of objectives that would have said stayed blurred. Uh, there are ESG criteria today that are the uh, object of measures, of a, a growing attention on uh, uh, from the, the, the stakeholders. But uh, a drawback is that when you measure something, you don't measure something else. Huh? You're focused on one thing. So there are choices on what you measure according to the available data, the facility sometimes, of, uh, 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 of uh, uh, addressing a, a measurable concept, which will determine the choice of objectives and criteria. You have to be careful because sometimes you can leave behind a series of objectives that are high value and very important, but more difficult to measure. So let's not hide behind the measure and saying we haven't reached other objectives that are relevant. But inversely, uh, it can be, you can want to measure in a very blurry fashion and uh, claim that you are uh, uh, adopting ESG uh, concepts. And there's a very important debate that is uh, uh, appearing with what we call at the same t certain time the green washing. There's some criticism against the ESG washing. So we have to be very careful, like it happened for the green washing, very careful when a company says it will reach objectives and it measures the objectives, it has to deliver. Otherwise, there's a very important risk of uh, hurting your rep one's reputation. I can't see what time I have. I have one minute left. Okay, the most important. Ah. What? I'm at the Caisse de Depot, uh, uh, an investment of, we're an investor in Quebec, and the income uh, and strength of investors as a force of social, a strength of social change. The investor is the source of capital. The investor is either a share shareholder or the loaner, but the volume of cap, the capital, the orientation of the capital, investor, if investors are adopted, ESG criteria, it's a very powerful vector of change in our society. I'm pretty proud, I need to say, that uh, inside the Caisse des Depots and Investments of Quebec, uh, I can say we made a lot of progress. We're leaders, uh, especially on, on, on environmental criteria. We reduced uh, the, 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 the carbon footprint in our portfolio. It's true also for equity, diversity, inclusion. We have measurable criteria. And what's happening now is not only the result of of uh, one investor, but great institutional investors which are getting together, selecting their investing partners, not only the assets that they will detain, according to ESG criteria. And so there are uh, many reasons to be optimistic. We're heading in the right direction. We have to be very careful uh, to the fact that the society is monitoring uh, the uh, achievement of objectives, not only will we have to measure, but we will have to deliver. Thank you. Bien, je vous donne maintenant la parole. So the floor now is to Marlène Delvec, who is the Director General of Gare Connexion SNCF. Uh, thank you, SNCF. French Railroad. So, um, uh, go over the, the, the definition of CSR. It's the, uh, I think that I want to insist on the voluntary integration, the voluntary uh, voluntarism. It's, it's really uh, an action we're far from freedmen, from maximizing profit. And I'm convinced that the general interest, at least, that it's not hypocritical to act for the common good. Uh, uh, and the general interest is extremely important in our society. I'm convinced that for two reasons. First of all, there is a momentum. It's at the top of our agenda, a territorial urgency, ecological urgency. And, but there's a consensus. We're all together here. We all agree. There were the, the, the IPP agreements. Everybody agrees. I see uh, IPPC agreements. And that's why we. Uh, we, we were asked to introduce this uh, this topic. We have to act for the climate, for the territories. We have to act for the women and women and the SNCF group. There are strong lines, the uh, uh, territorial and climate, climate urgency. It's not for nothing that we have a ministry of planning, ecological planning and territorial cohesion. 
at, at the state level. And when we run 3,000 train stations, 10 million visitors, uh, users that visit our train stations every day, how can we act for the climate? When the train stations are at the intersection, cross section of two sectors of activity, mobility and infrastructure, the buildings. Mobility, well, train stations, well, the objective of a uh, train station is to board a train. We want to encourage people to take the train because the train is the most decarbonated way of transport. Jean-Pierre Farandou encourages uh, the railroad against carbon and he wants to double the modal share of railroad with a very strong transfer, uh, modal transfer from the car to the train. And so it's the, the what train stations are all about, encourage using the train. And our job is to manage buildings. And again, with buildings, we have a lot of stakes, challenges, energy-wise. What is our energy impact? And again, sobriety, uh, reducing our energy consumption, pull out of fossil energies, and the energy mix also, this uh, RTE uh, report, FTE, uh, for the Transport Network of Energy, uh, which uh, encouraged us to create renewable energies and for Gare Connection, it's more than million square meters of solar panels that will be in our French stations in the ten years to come. Eco design, eco renovation, eco rehabilitation. I don't want to list all our actions, but after the climate, the territories. Train stations, 3,000 stations, 3,000 communities. Uh, we cover the whole of the French territory. And for us, there's not the large stations, it's all the train stations that have their importance for SNCF, Gare Connexion, and notably for the SNCF group. Again, we act, we act to make our stations uh, offer better service, co-working activities tomorrow, um, uh, electrical uh, recharge stations for cars, uh, more services in our train station. We act for culture also with more than 200 exhibits uh, again, the, democrat uh, the, the democratization of culture, we're fighting against, we're bringing to each territory uh, culture by means of our train stations, which uh, form, uh, which cover the whole territory. Everybody who used the train recently, you saw the uh, train, the X train station, you saw the wonderful exhibit uh, from the, the, the Roque d'Enterron music festival. So after the climate, the territory, the men and women, first of all, our customers. Well, for our customers, uh, socially speaking, we want our train stations to be accessible. Uh, 720 train stations were made more accessible. It's a real challenge. It's a stake for the men and women of enterprise. Still, I'm a one man. For the men and women of enterprise, 7.97% of physically disabled people. What's important for me is that we need to act. And acting, I said in the introduction, is that uh, you have to have uh, the will, willingness, but it's also cooperation. And that's why I'm very happy to be that we all are an ex right, together. We're very far from the dilemma of the prisoner where each actor is asking, acting in his own corner or our own corner. What is important is we all, all together, to meet these challenges uh, for, uh, on the CSR aspect, to transform the world, which in the end is the the main theme of this conference and our conviction my conviction is willingness and cooperation so we all talk together for our CSR companies I'm telling I'm told that I have to stop thank you <laughs> very much Merci infiniment. thank you very much I'm now going to hand the floor to Virginie Chauvin uh, who represents Mazar in France. Thank you very much. At Mazar, which is a, an auditing company, when we exited the crisis, we wanted to question the French to see what their expert expectations were from companies. So we are auditors, which means listening, listening to the French people with a uh, poll company. So first of all, there was a lot of optimi optimism People are 80% of those questioned consider that businesses can 
change things positively. So there are high expectations there. Businesses arrive are in second place behind citizens and ahead of the state. The second lesson which we learned was a uh, sketch of um, the company that the type of companies that uh, French trusted with solidarity, transparency and honesty. I'm going to talk about the first two, uh, caring and responsibility and solidarity. These are inclusion, the way that a company is inclusive. That means that there are the civilians want companies to be more involved in their ecosystem and play a bigger role, particularly with associations. Associations and business working together can go further because we at Mazar, at our business, we uh, provide a lot of skills. We work with associations and we give them skills. We teach their workers and that's, uh, we all, uh, we work on Mazar Day, so each of our employees spends one day going out to help associations. We do that individually and as a team to try and help associations. The second lot of values, honesty and transparency, well, this is more ethics-based, and that corresponds to the ESG washing and the green washing we've just been listening about. So you have to carry out concrete actions, and those concrete actions have to be highlighted and rendered uh, reliable because there are some doubts which arise as to whether there's not some ulterior motive. And it's very difficult for businesses uh, that's to cope with regulations. You have to provide uh, special information which can be compared between from one company to the next. In the financial world, we're um, familiar with that, but now it's not to do with finance. So there's the GDPR, there's taxonomy, all kinds of laws there so that the consumer can trust us. The third lesson from this survey is that businesses are thought to be capable of working for the general good. 88% of those questioned consider that the that, that uh, financial uh, benefit is uh, not necessarily opposite to the general good. 88% of people think that they can be reconcilable. That means for businesses that they can transform their business models to include notions of RSE, of CSR rather, in their uh, decision making. We we have uh, companies today are uh, focusing more on CSR and having that integrated into the decision making process. When we go off on a, a convention, we're asked how much it's going to cost, but also how much will it cost in carbon terms? What will the uh, carbon footprint of each participant when they travel? And the final decision is uh, a question of arbitration between the two. The best arbitration gives you your decision. And that means that we are looking in the longer term for our decisions. And the fourth and final segment of our survey said that Fr the French people are hoping that work is going to be organized in a different way. At the end of the, con of the end of lockdown, it was hardly surprising because a lot of people have been re working, were working from home with quite a lot of flexibility and quite a lot of people enjoyed that flexibility. But for it all to work in the long term, then you need to question your managerial culture. And so change is needed there with uh, a different mindset. So there's a lot of stronger porosity between the personal life and the professional life because there's the lines are blurred. And there's also a role in guiding youngsters. The average age at our company is 29. So we really do have a responsibility to guide them in their first experience in the world of work. And that involves setting limits. We organized a few months ago a month of tranquility. That means we uh, stopped uh, all unnecessary emails about all kinds of things. That wasn't just we did that for a month and then we went back to normal. The idea was to change the way we go about doing things and start thinking about things. And it, start, it 
nurtured new um, ways of communicating, which is less systematic. So now you think twice before you hit that send button. Final component, this is value sharing, which is a very complex subject and needs to be worked on so that we can all get to grips with that. This survey says that we will all have to become bilingual in financial and non-financial language, whereas we were only talking in financial terms prior to that. Thank you. Well done. I'm going to hand the floor now to Thierry Martel, who is general manager of Groupama. Hello, everybody. Of course, I'm miles, miles away from Milton Friedman's uh, approach, as we mentioned earlier on, because we are a mutualistic fund. We have a different view of capital, although uh, we uh, do have to suffer these competitive markets. A mutual company is not going to remunerating its stakeholders because with dividends. There is no capital. The, uh, it's, we don't start off with capital. That's the end position, if you like. It's the result of what we've managed to build up over the years. In a mutualistic uh, company, uh, capital is shared by all, and it's made available to the collectivity and can be used to innovate to prolong the life of the organization and its services. And that there are two very major consequences of that. First is that the value that you create is shared between clients who are also shareholders. They're involved in governance and uh, they are the guarantee of a good ratio between quality and price. And we have the uh, workers as well. We have a generous social model and we aim to be responsible employers whilst uh, overlook, overseeing the commitment of our employees. The value which we create corresponds to a reason for existing, which is the very reason that we exist for. Mutualists uh, gather together around a determined goal. It's an approach which is bottom up not at all top-down. And the bottom-up approach has always meant that we have to um, be responsible in terms of solidarity and impact, and we have to uh, re re report on that. In real life, this uh, social responsibility comes up against two hurdles which are not uh, which are beyond our control. The first hurdle is the conflict which can exist between a company's profit and some uh, peripheral factors. We, for example, at Group AMA, are there to enable as many people as possible to build their life in all trust, and we are based on communities that help each other. This is a reason for existing, which is very broad, it's very uh, engaging, but it doesn't cover all stakes. And so there are some blind spots in our parameter, let's say, the way in which we invest our assets, which are not part and parcel of our reason for being, and the way in which we um, uh, repair when there are claims what is used and what is put to one side. So. This is uh, all part and parcel of our ambitious CSR. We often come uh, up against the competitive markets where there are specific laws. So our members are going to over pay over for the services which uh, we are providing, whereby they have to live in the real economic world. So I think the only uh, good, uh, uh, right thing to do is we have to mix up uh, constraints and encouragement. So we have the carrot and the stick, if you like. I'm absolutely sure that uh, rules and regulations must stimulate innovation. Rules and regulations must also always be looking for the best compromise between what is desirable and what is possible in time. And let's not forget that the goal of all business is to survive thanks to growth which is realistic without a growth 
objective, the uh, enterprise has no motivation left, and uh, it isn't thriving in economic terms or social terms. However, in my mind, there is no doubt about it, sustainable development is impossible without a sustainable environment. This is no new idea. Henry Ford, back in 1920, he said that a business had to make profit, otherwise it would die. But if you try to make a company work only on profit, then it will also die because it will no longer have any reason for existing. So let's be clear. Uh, Rules of regulations and entrepreneurship are not antagonistic. They just have to come to a nice kind of uh, contract. So how many major principles are smashed as soon as uh, they are difficult to implement? Uh, coal is a current example. There are three limiting factors which are classical when you talk about social responsibility. The first is our inability to examine a process from one end to the other. Also, we are uh, focusing on short-term problems. We'll just hope for the best for the long term. Uh, the, someone has always said that there's no problem that the Americans cannot solve as long as it is profitable. And uh, behavior is another question. One gesture which might be okay for an individual is no longer acceptable if there are billions of people making that gesture. I think we must never forget that most of the problems that we are faced with today are just the consequence of problems, of the solutions to problems that arose in the past. So we have to try and find that a tricky path in between uh, dura durability uh, and uh, acceptability. When uh, a company's results are negative, that's never uh, the desired outcome. They can be the sub-product product of the provision of vital services, such as farming, for example, and we are particularly uh, keen on farming. It's not a question of uh, shrugging off our responsibilities. A business's role is to minimize their own impact. And because I see that my time is counted here, I'm just going to finish off with a quote from saint exupéry And we, as a farming group, uh, uh, are close to this, Saint-Exupéry group, see what said, that uh, we are not inheriting the land from our parents. We are watching over it for our children. I think that's something which we can all keep in mind. Et maintenant, la parole est à Monsieur. Yes, and now we're going to hear from the FNAC. We have Enrique Martinez. Well, I'm the last person to speak, and there's very little time for me to speak. Donc, évidemment, of course, uh, companies have to be responsible. Of course, I think it's. Uh, Use, pointless saying it. Yes, over recent years, we know there's all kinds of legislation. In our teams, we have learned to better uh, examine the extra financial impacts of our businesses. We uh, work with Dati, and uh, we've got one million square meters of uh, sales area, hundreds of millions of products which uh, pass through our premises, go to your homes and then onto the trash. There are a lot of questions that we didn't know to answer, and that was the, the start of being able to get better. We have at our disposal all kinds of tombs for t tools for measuring and identifying trajectories, not only in terms of decarbonation, but uh, we want to become a more socially responsible company. That's uh, all well and good. Now, we all are in different business sectors. We've all got our experience with us. We come from the distribution, the retail, and the consumption sectors where uh, there is, is going un undergoing transformation and it's not ended. Of course, there was COVID, which uh, added further pressure to our model. But we have been through 20 years of digitization, and that really has applied great uh, pressure in terms of uh, the, uh, our economics and, uh, and social aspects, and the deep transformation is going to continue into the future. So the contradiction of all of that is that we have to be 
on that train. We have to be socially responsible. And at the same time, in our business, we're not the most profitable sector. We are not attracting the most investors in the world. So we're almost on the dark side of the economy. However, we are part of the economy, which is so useful. So how do we look at these two aspects as we leave COVID? We've managed to get through COVID. Uh, thank heavens we've survived that period. We decided to use those constraints of uh, the transition into the heart of our CSR. We have decided to make our group's reason for existing to be an active, responsible player above and beyond the obligations to foster um, sustainable consumption. So we have decided, and we call that our mission statement, it's uh, our choice, our enlightened choice on the ecological transition. That means that 80% of the carbon impact that we are co-responsible for it's not a question of the transport and how I arrange my products in my shop. It's not all that. It's the way you, the way you are going to use the products that you buy from us, and how many years those um, products will give you satisfaction and will be useful to you. So this is kind of the limit of all of these different uh, extra financial assessment models which compare things which cannot be compared. We could quite simply have uh, been satisfied with reducing uh, scopes one and two of carbon. We could have said uh, sex uh, equality. We could have said all kinds of things like that. And we uh, would have invested in those fields and we would have been the champions. That however, would have been extremely uh, contradictory with all of our social uh, commitments, because everything uh, we sell has a huge um, impact. So we are far from having learned how to measure impact on society. And these extra financial criteria are kind of limited, as we've already said. But uh, I think you know, we have a lot of work to be done. We have committed to this transformation, and once again, we are going to have to put our business model at risk. We may be selling fewer products because we're going to repair products more. Or, earlier on, there was uh, an interesting session on uh, the labor market, but the market has not created the conditions for these transitions. There's a huge challenge there. And we won't be able to do it all on our own. Although we've trained 1,000 uh, technicians to create, uh, to uh, repair products, but that's just a drop in the ocean of everything that society has to do to support this digital and ecological transition. I think that thought must be given to how business sectors, which may not be the most profitable, how they are going to contribute also. There's a key component, that is, to make these uh, units of competitiveness and uh, profitability identical. You can't compare your company with a company that doesn't have the same obligations. It's just not possible to do, because that would uh, bring into peril all of uh, society. It would threaten the existence of society. And so we have to make sure that the playing field is as flat as possible for everybody. And I personally am also suspicious about whether or not we're entering into a recession cycle. Is, this, is the economy slowing down? And what kind of trajectory will decarbonation have? So you can start off in a period of growth. It may survive uh, the um, crisis. So the shareholders who have pushed us to move along this uh, uh, CSR avenue, are they going to accept the cost that that incurs? Thank you very much. Uh, to conclude, the floor is to Virginie Morgan, Director General of ADO. Good, ap good afternoon, everybody. So for those who don't know ADO, it's a good uh, 
link with uh, Enrique's question. We're investors, we're shareholders of several uh, uh, corporations in France and Europe, and if uh, Enrique worked with uh, an investor like Eurasio, the answer to his last question, but it is a, a listed company, so the answer would be yes. Yes. Congratulations, and I'll give you facts on our commitments rather than just talk uh, to shed a new light on what was said this afternoon. Uh, for me, uh, Razio's commitment was the bring together of um, new sets of awareness and conviction. Awareness, well, it dates back to uh, more than 15 years ago was the seriousness of the situation in which we are, uh, with the climate, the uh, uh, the reports of the uh, IPCC, nobody looks at them anymore. We have three years to stabilize the situation, eight years to reduce by 45 percent the uh, gas emissions. The uh, And secondly, the uh, awareness well, is on the precariousness and the, the social divide, notably in the U.S., but also in Europe. Great social divide. and. Uh, the slowdown of all organizations, even those who are very convinced. So the uh, lack of momentum, and in front of that, you have convictions. One thing that is uh, absolute certainty, I'm a woman of conviction. When you read uh, studies, the recent studies have known for a long time that we are better by diverse by being diversified, whether uh, when you talk of gender, social origin, cultural origin, you take better decisions with with the diversity of people involved, and our uh, performance are, are better. And um, second conviction is the leaders that will move faster against uh, social inequalities will be the big winners in the years to come. So when you put face in awareness and conviction, as you specific, with a view to some companies that are represented here, is that we can choose the sectors in which we will invest. What we invest, every five or six years, we can totally change uh, what is Eurasio at time T. And today, after 10 years of conviction, uh, awareness, you see us with a balance in our investments where 80 percent of our in, uh, investments are done uh, to back uh, transition companies that we accompany in their development and deployment, uh, climate development, and uh, more than a scientific scope, we, propose, we promote uh, STBI, uh, the permanent measuring of the balances related to inclusion, diversity, and the measuring of the best performance, that's one thing. And the second thing, it's about 20% of our investments today. It's not sufficient, but 20% are for solutions. There are enterprises that directly contribute to the uh, 1.5 carbon tra tra trajectory or contribute to a better inclusion. About 1.5 billion is invested in a circular economy business like Back Market, for example, to name one, and about two billion and a half invested in corporation companies that are in the biotech sector, health, providing better access to a better quality of life, prolonging uh, the shelf life and uh, the health for everybody. I think this 80-20 ratio, the result takes a lot of time to transform an enterprise, but would I want a 60-40, 60 for 60 transition and 40 for solution? I don't know, but what I know is that the biggest impact to really achieve a better carbon impact and uh, in terms of diversity and inclusion, I think we have invest uh, and support transition. Investing around Article 9, for example, to uh, what is well understood in France on around uh, products or uh, enterprises who are for solutions is very far from being sufficient today. And, um, so we need to do it all. We uh, were not, we 
did not start in uh, the oil and gas. We, we will not invest in oil and gas. That's not our trade. But you will see Eurasio invest behind energy transition schemes or digital transition pro programs with uh, funds that are called Smart City, Maritime, for example, which finance the transition of uh, uh, vessel uh, fleets or transitions of cities towards more modern economies and uh, uh, less consuming. Uh, so th this is my conclusion. For the companies who can choose to do so, the enterprise is uh, uh, much more mobile, uh, much and contrary to what Mil Milton Friedman thought, uh, or the Wokies of today, all the demonstrations are done at all levels for all the stakeholders, from the creation of embarked value, financial and extra financial. And I don't think there will be, we will go back to the past. Uh, there will be some phases of consolidation and stabilization, notably in this phase of recession, but today we will not go back. We, the investments, uh, will be done and all the stakeholders, whether employees, investors um, and actors of this transformation are uh, totally committed to do so. Thank you. Thank you and I hope you're right. So to start the debate between us all, I'd like to ask the first question, double question. Do you think that by giving all the power to the shareholders in an enterprise, it's possible to reach the, object, the CSR objectives? Or should we change this kind of capitalism and trade this capitalism for a stakeholder capitalism? And what stakeholders are we talking about? So who wishes to answer? I can start. It's not a definitive answer here. <laughs> uh, the answer is no. We cannot count on the sole enterprises. Democracy is broader than that. And so when we say that laws are imperfect and that regulations are imperfect, it doesn't mean that the states do not have an important role to play. And when if we talk of energy transition, we talk about the need of uh, speeding up the transition to a renewable energy, these are not only private investments, they are also, in a great part, public investments. So we have to rely on each other to achieve this. And so we have to go beyond where we stand today. We start with an idea where there's the shareholders respected the law, uh, but we noted, we realized that we had to take into consideration the environmentalist, the, uh, the, the society, and all this has to be recombined. But they don't have the power in the enterprise, those other. Uh, I think you're a bit harsh, huh? a bit tough. You're a bit tough on shareholders. I consider that uh, for, in Europe, for example, the shareholders the first to uh, encourage enterprise to be uh, more socially responsible and committed. A lot of companies have become bicorp and they created, they declared their mission statement. Uh, in the meetings of the boards, they passed the resolutions that were not compulsory on commitments related to their core business. Uh, in the sense of uh, ESG, all of these resolutions were voted at 99.8%. Uh, the shareholder has a power not as important as you said. The shareholder in uh, Anglo-Saxon law has a lot more power in France, notably uh, French corporations, the management, employees have a role and a significant power to bring the company, whether financially or extra financially, towards uh, the conquer, conquering uh, successes with the full support of shareholders. Well, yes, uh, they wanted to stop you from talking. Ah, it's censorship. We had a discussion before uh, coming on stage. Did we believe that society by itself should be held responsible? No, I think we understood that. Um, uh, no. What I was the one who said uh, the performance 
is not incompatible for shareholders. It's necessary. The responsibility to guarantee the performance of shares. Uh, the, the, so that has to be demonstrated with figures beyond words. You have to uh, uh, make sure that people understand that uh, a, a company that is not responsible will not have access to the capital market, but also to talents, and especially the young people. They are very demanding on how we uh, project ourselves uh, in this new society, very demanding on the actions we have today in the CSR. If you, if you don't have capitals, if you don't have teams, well, you're, you're not going anywhere. So I share this. For me, the shareholder is the state. But uh, the responsibility and the CSR is uh, very much supported by the state with mission. The governance of enterprises is very uh, strongly encouraged uh, to work on the CSR. When you're a member of the board, you see how these topics are uh, strongly addressed. And the parties, the, the youth, ah, you were talking about the young people. The youth want sent meaning. If you don't give meaning to what you're doing, you won't attract them. And our clients also, our clients, our customers, are looking for meaning. When people choose the train because it's more decarbonated, well, then it's a choice of it has meaning. And our funders, our, our, our shareholders, also want us to be uh, exempt, exemplary. And so the state is very strong committed on that, but I'm convinced that it's all the enterprises today that are uh, let's say uh, committed. Uh, cares about Friedman. He's not. He's not there to see it. But uh, but companies who have shareholder, as myself, I don't have shareholders. But as an institutional investor, I think we could be the driving force in, in for change, because we will have. Uh, we are accountable, and how we invest our funds will be a determining factor. And also, the regulations will use uh, institutionals to shift, make the enterprises shift. And uh, when you look at the uh, mass it represents, we will have a um, very important play, us institutionals, uh, in, the, in this change. So to conclude this little debate, I'm thinking of a, a great economist, uh, Albert Ershman, who wrote a wonderful uh, book, Exit, Voice and Loyalty. And he shows in this uh, work, in this book, the importance for economic agents, for citizens, uh, for the un trade union, uh, trade unions. So the importance of the voice, the importance of claiming, of saying, of making pressure, saying no, it's unacceptable. And that's what explains that uh, the customers can uh, abandon a company which doesn't have a virtuous behavior, and I think it's very important. Uh, and. Uh, we see today the importance to recruit talents. You talked about that just earlier. To what extent um, young people join a company only if this company is virtuous. There's the voice, and it has become, will become increasingly important. And the exit, it's to vote with your legs. That is not to join the company or not buying its product. Uh, and I think that's what will be decisive in the future. In other words, uh, political economy was de designed on a basis, and that is the egocentricity of individual, egotism of individuals. Everything was built based on that. And, after that, how well, the idea is to know how you can reconcile these interests that should lead to the war against everyone. Uh, but this said, it's an I, false hypothesis insofar that we know that the behavior of individuals can be based on sympathy. And the founders of uh, economic science, in, in fact, uh, put an accent on these two accent, uh, aspects, but nevertheless, we need to take into account egotistic behaviors, and the uh, problem is to find the means to bring these behaviors to a new way of thinking where the society will be satisfied, and the state is very important because it enables to 
to organize this coordination of interest and not sort of think about uh, punctual uh, intervention. But it's the government's responsibility to ensure the convergence of interest. I'll stop here uh, because it's. Uh, I, I was violently asked to stop this conference, but we have this, this session. But we have now two minutes for Q and A. For Q and A, one question, one question on sympathy, empathy. Oh, okay, we're done.